Welcome to Spirit Podcast, a boozy dive into mythology, legends, and folklore. Every week we pour a drink and learn about a new story from around the world. It is 2020, and I'm Amanda. And I'm Julia. And this is episode 161, Monster of the Week with Emily Vanderwerf. I, one, can't believe we got to talk to Emily. She is a, a fantastic writer and just a really knowledgeable and overall charismatic and wonderful person. And a podcaster. And a podcaster. And two, I I can't believe it's 2020. Oh, oh my God. Huh. I know. I feel like uh, 2019 being my first year of full self-employment. I know you're second, I guess, Julia, or second and a half. Yeah, second and a half. Or like first and a half? I don't remember. I don't time, remember. Time for, is irrelevant. I think, <laughs> yeah, for, for both of us, either our first or second full year. And uh, time just passes differently when uh, y- everything is on your shoulders. Mm-hmm. And it's good. It's bad. It's terrifying. It's wonderful. Um, and it's uh, I'm up for another year. Yeah. And we wouldn't be able to do the kind of things that we do without our wonderful patrons. Truly, the only reason that I am not suffering and crying after work every day in a terrible job is because of the support of our patrons. It's true. Yeah, it is. So welcome, Anna, Diamond, Leanne, and I'm with. What a great name. Just fill in the blank. So good. Thank you. Who are you with right now, Julia? I'm with our supporting producer level patrons. Oh, so Philip, Megan, Deborah, Molly, Skyla, Samantha, Sammy, Neil, Jessica, and Phil Fresh. Who join our legend level patrons. These are the folks that get a physical gift from us in the mail every dang month. Josie, Kylie, Charlotte, Kylo the Husky, Morgan, Emily, BMEF Scotty, Audra, Chris, Mark, Mr. Folk, Sarah, and Jack Marie. What wonderful folks. What what good starts to the year is listing off those people's names. They also give me an excuse to go browsing for cute gifts without spending my own money on stuff I don't need because I get to send them wonderful things that they absolutely do need. Yeah, I love when I get Facebook ads and I'm just like, oh, the legend level patrons would love that. This is it. This is the thing. Speaking of which, you made a delicious and very festive cocktail for this episode, Julia. Can you tell us about it? Yeah, for this year, I'm going to recommend that you all... Make yourself a New Year's cocktail. I'm a big fan of the poinsettia, which is a cocktail made with Cointreau, cranberry juice, and champagne. It's very like, if my childhood could have made an alcoholic cocktail, it would be this cocktail. (laughs) Yeah. Cointreau is the only liquor that I ever drank when I was home. Like when I was, you know, 21, visiting home uh, in my last year of college, I would do Cointreau with my dad's like bizarre, very strange whiskeys um, that they kept over the fridge. And unlike some other siblings of mine, never stole liquor from the cabinet, only drank it with my dad watching uh, reruns of, I don't know, MASH late at night. Sure. Sounds right. Uh, You can serve this as a New Year's Day brunch cocktail. Personally, I like it as a brunch cocktail. It's still like light enough and like the like sourness of the cranberry is really nicely balanced with the Cointreau. Uh, Or you could just keep it in your pocket for next year's New Year's Eve. Delicious. I uh, just made cranberry sauce the other day, not because it was Thanksgiving, but because it's delicious. Yes. And I think more cranberry year round. That's what yeah. I'm here for. No, I'm I'm all for cranberry full time. Mm. I just I finally like gotten to the point in my life where I will buy myself like cranberry juice without it being like a luxury. Oh yeah, hundred percent. Speaking of luxuries and and spending your free time doing such luxurious things, Amanda. Yeah. What, what what are you up to? What what are you reading? What are you watching? So I wanted to meet my Goodreads challenge this year, which was reading 40 books, which is fewer than I have in previous years, but um, especially, you know, working so much. I wanted to make sure that I did the hobbies that I know I love, which for me is reading, uh, specifically fiction. So I'm going to recommend a scary mystery detective thriller type thing, which I love, and also a very cute rom-com meet cute book. Just beautiful. Pick Good your balance. own adventure. You know? balance. So on the one hand, I'm going to recommend Jane Harper. She writes like detective mystery thrillers, um, two of which are in a series. And there's also a standalone novel. And they are set in Australia, which is cool for me. I don't think I've ever read an Australian uh, mystery before. And it's just like a different landscape, you know, like different uh, customs, different vocabulary. And I really enjoyed it. They're very well written. And even though, again, it has to do with violence, it doesn't take like violence against women um, as a sort of like natural thing in the world. Yeah. As a given, which some authors do do that. And secondly, I really loved Well Met by Jen DeLuca. It's a rom-com book that takes place at a Renaissance fair. (gasps) Julie, what more could you want? Oh, hold on. Pulling up, pulling up my local indie bookstore's website right now to order that. Thank you. It gave me such intense, like, nostalgia for a thing I never experienced. Do you (laughs) know what I mean? 
Yes. No, I absolutely know what you mean. That's like the first time I ever played Dungeons and Dragons. I was like, I was meant to play this game, huh? All right. I had a a real wave of sadness recently that I did not play D&D before I was, you know, 25. I get you. And that's actually a really good segue that I didn't plan into our kind of request for you this week and how to support Multitude. And that's, listen, it's a new year. You got new podcasts. This is your time to check out the other Multitude shows. And one that Julia and I are both going to be on in 2020 is Join the Party. This is an improvised storytelling fiction podcast. That means that we sit down every other week and use the rules of Dungeons and Dragons to tell a story. This story is set in a modern world. It is absurd. It is wonderful. It is very close to Julia's and my hearts. And we are going to be starting that in very early March. But in the meantime, you can catch up on season one. You can listen to our after parties, which teach you how to play D&D and talk about just the world and how to do it. And also all of the bonus content. I did a goat related uh, caper set yes, at the Met did. Ball uh, this past summer called Goat Party. So Gaga. lots of stuff to love. Gaga. Gaga. Oh, gosh. Yeah, I'm I'm very excited to be joining Join the Party, mostly because I'm very already emotionally invested in my character and I'm going to cry oh, yeah. when people meet them. It's super exciting. And of course, there is also Potterless, where our good friend Mike reads the Harry Potter books, but also experiences the broader Harry Potter universe uh, every single week. So whether it's talking about a theme park, about uh, wizarding, Price is Right, or reviewing the books, movies, rides, it is a wonderful show. There's always snark and hot takes to be had and lots of great guests, including all of us here at Multitude and tons of our friends and new friends. And of course, there's also Horse, which is hosted by Mike and Eric Silver. And I have never really cared about basketball ever in my entire life. But Horse is about not the wins and losses and the stats and all that kind of stuff. But it's about the weird stuff that happens when you create a culture around a sport. Yeah, they have fascinating interviews. They talk about the WNBA, the NBA, all kinds of history about basketball, like the U.S. men's Olympic basketball team that went to Germany under Hitler's rule. So there is substance, there is style, there are laughs, there are great contests, and Mike and Eric have a wonderful dynamic. So check out those Multitude shows by plugging Multitude into your podcast player or by going to multitude.productions. And I don't want to I don't want to tease anything that isn't quite announced yet, but I will say there are more Multitude things coming in 2020. There sure is. And it's going to be awesome. And the only way that we get to do this and keep doing it is for the support of listeners like you, as my local PBS station used to say. So genuinely, no matter how much you can or can't support us on Patreon, listening to our shows, telling us that you like them on social media and recommending them to your friends is uh, just a wonderful thing that we do not take for granted whatsoever and uh, will help start our 2020 off right. Yeah. We appreciate you, and we hope that you go into 2020 with the best vibes possible. And so without further ado, please enjoy the wonderful episode 161, Monster of the Week with Emily Vanderwerf. We are so excited to have Emily Vanderwerf on the show today. She is a critic at Vox, a Hilda Stan, per your Twitter bio. Uh, Thank you, Emily, as am I. Uh, The co-creator of Arden and the author of Monsters of the Week, which is a critical companion to The X-Files and also the host of Primetime, the the Vox TV history podcast. Welcome, Emily. I, I do a lot of things, apparently. You I'm, do. I'm, I'm so happy to be here. Oh, yay. You do a lot of things, and they're all shockingly wonderful every well, time. I, uh, <laughs> I don't know about that, but I try. Well, <laughs> listen, we, we don't flatter here on Spirits Podcast. We drink and we tell truth. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. It's very true. Very true. I would love if you could just kind of start by giving your thesis of Monster of the Week as a trope for our listeners who might not be familiar with the concept. Right. Monster of the Week really as a idea first sort of came into public consciousness with the TV show The X-Files, where they needed a a divide between the episodes that were part of what they called their mythology, which was this weird, long, overarching story about uh, aliens and bees 
and oil and like it was really convoluted and complicated and if you were 15 year old me you were super into it and if you <laughs> were not 15 year old me you were not super into it um but then they had all these other episodes because they did up to 25 episodes a season so those other episodes were just like Mulder and Scully went to a town and there was a monster and they met the monster and they like fought the monster and then the monster escaped and they started calling those monster of the week episodes and the name really stuck and now it's just kind of like if you have a show that's in sort of genre uh, adjacent, Monster of the Week has become like the way you refer to like even like, you know, Star Trek Discovery or whatever. They might mm. they'll have Monster of the Week type episodes. Um, it's, of course, a spinoff of Case of the Week from the detective procedural, but it really has taken on a life of its own uh, and has just become like a central to the way we talk about these shows. Hence the title of, of the book that uh, Zach and I wrote. Yeah. You know, I use monster of the week to refer to any like procedural where that episode doesn't like advance in a material way, the larger plot, including elementary on CBS, my favorite <laughs> TV show, uh, which is like, if that is an adaptation of Sherlock Holmes, like that should be the case of the week. But I have never heard that phrase. And I think that truly marks me as a child of the internet. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> this is, yeah, this is really true. Like there's case of the week, um, house had disease of the week. Like mm. there were all, like, there are all of sorts of different different spinoffs and it started with case of the week but monster of the week is the one that's had the most resonance because of course the kinds of people who talk obsessively about television are also frequently uh, obsessively like following science fiction and horror television so yeah. i and it's probably just a, a me thing but i think i can recognize and remember like a vampire or an alien or a werewolf more than i can recognize like polio or whatever the the house uh, disease is this week <laughs> yeah yeah uh polio uh or it sure. ricket, you know rickets or it was never scurvy that was the thing on house they were always like mm -hmm. is it no lupus lupus, lupus. was the it thing was it never, never was lupus. <laughs> never lupus that was julia's and my like huge bonding pop culture uh, uh property in high school That's i don't true. i really don't know why i said scurry i feel like i should be fired because like, no, I mean, it was rarely <laughs> scurvy either. I, mean, I can think scurvy? of maybe one scurvy maybe episode. One. <laughs> <laughs> so the the monster of the week genre has obviously grown into something that is is much larger than it was when it was just X Files. Do you have any examples of shows that you think really exemplify the monster of the week that are currently running? Currently running. That's well, I mean, obviously Supernatural. Like yes. Supernatural <laughs> is. Supernatural is, I, I don't know if I'd say the most successful, but just in terms of how long it's run, yeah, it's it's the longest running Monster of the Week show. Um, it has lapped everybody else. It has lapped many of these shows consecutive, like, like several times. Like you think about a show mm -hmm. like Fringe, which ran exactly 100 episodes, and I think... I think Supernatural got to 300? Like, I, I, yeah. I, and like... How on earth is that possible? Like even X Files, kind of the 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 granddaddy of this genre. Like they got to two oh two on their first run, and then they they mm -hmm. called it quits. Like that Supernatural will have run fifteen years by the time it ends in the spring is just like astonishing to me, especially because they had a planned mythology that was that was mm -hmm. supposed to run five years, and it did. They they just did their original story arc, and then. Uh, the CW was like, you, do you want to keep going? And the creator was like, not really, but I'll turn it over to uh, this other woman on staff, Sarah Gamble, one of my one of my favorite TV writers. Like, mm. and and she was like, yeah, I'll keep it going. And then they run like ten seasons beyond their planned endpoint, and it's like. For the most part, I don't regularly watch the show anymore, but for the most part, you know, fans seem pretty happy with what's happened since then. So that, that I think, is a show where the Monster of the Week trope showed its sheer elasticity. Actually, it, it really overlaps nicely with, with uh, what you folks do on this show, because that is a show that's like, like if X-Files was based in weird uh, government conspiracies, Supernatural's based in like weird urban legends. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they've, got, they've gotten away from that, because of course you do after 300 episodes, like 
what are you guys going to be talking about over 300 episodes? You know, I don't know right? <laughs> I don't even. I think I'm going to just start revisiting old things, which I'm sure Supernatural has oh, done yeah. as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, another show that I think does interesting things with the monster of the week trope is The Magicians on Sci-Fi, which is oh. not coincidentally show run by Sarah Gamble. Um, mm. And it is not Monster of the Week in the traditional sense. It's more of a magical problem of the week question. Mm. But those problems tend to manifest themselves as like monsters or magical creatures that are, are you know, hard to approach or whatever. And the monsters can be fun or they can be creepy or they can be silly or whatever. But like, that is a show where it has an incredibly complicated ongoing plot that is almost impossible to follow. Mm. But so long as you're tapped into the emotional core of that week's episode, you can like ride it out. So I think The Magicians is another show that's doing interesting things with that trope. And there are, you know, there are lots of other different ones. Um, Sabrina, The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina on mm, Netflix mm-hmm. definitely has its own variations on this trope. But to me, Supernatural is just like the clear like example of somebody who's done this trope and done it well and done it well for a long, long time. Yeah. I wasn't aware of that kind of like handing over of the show after an original plot arc had been fulfilled. That's like a Simone Biles level of sticking the landing. Like that must be so <laughs> yeah. hard to pull off. Yeah. And like, I remember hearing they were going to do that and I was like, okay, well, this show's got maybe two years left and it tops. And like the show was on the verge of cancellation year after year after year. And uh, I guess like the CW just needed programming. It could sort of slap on and draw a reliable audience. And then it goes on Netflix and becomes like a hit on Netflix. And it's not like hugely rated on first run television, but it is a really well performing show. Like the CW is going to miss it once it's gone. But yeah. also, fifteen years—what a long time to be on any show. Yeah, yeah, that is a commitment. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I would love to ask you what you think makes a good monster, and that's like a topic I'm sure you could do an entire podcast on. Um, but it maybe specifically in a monster of the week episode, and then also what are some really fascinating like deviations from that norm? Um, like on on AV Club, you posted a or they posted a excerpt of um, a chapter of the X Files book on Bad Blood, which is one of my favorite episodes as well, and I think mm-hmm. does a really interesting kind of like subversion or inversion of what a monster is supposed to be. So let's start maybe with the uh, the typical, and then get into our favorite. Um, sort of inversions of that trope. Well, I was thinking about the roots of Monster of the Week, and like I was going to jokingly say that Grendel was the original Monster of the Week, but like (laughs) he kind of was. Like like, the structure of Beowulf is very similar to a Monster of the Week TV show, like Mm. where you go from Grendel to Grendel's mom to the dragon. I think I'm missing one in there, but like (laughs) that book or that poem rather is just like, like a series of episodes that add up to a larger story. And uh, what does that remind you of? So Mm -hmm. like the classic version of the monster of the week is that the monster reflects something emotionally in the landscape of either the hero or the world or the audience. Like, Ideally, all three of those things. I think the show that was really good at doing that was Buffy the Vampire Slayer, where their monsters of the week were often metaphors for certain emotions that teenagers go through or young adults go through. And really, like when we talk about what makes a good monster, it's that it's tapped into some primal human emotion uh, that we all fear. Like, like the like vampires are probably the most durable and successful monster vampires Mm. or ghosts. So let's, let's take a look at both of them and vampires are like, there are a lot of different ways you can approach the question of what a vampire symbolizes, but the desire for eternal youth, like that's a thing we can all relate to. The desire to never die is a thing we can all relate to. And also Mm. like they are a wonderful metaphor for the powerful who prey upon the powerless, which is a Mm -hmm. consistent problem throughout human history so like Mm -hmm. there's a reason the vampire has stuck around similar with ghosts like ghosts are just basically we are afraid of death but we are also like afraid of like 
not dying. Like there, there's like right. both sides of that coin embodied in the ghost and like every single culture on earth. I mean, I'm, that's maybe overstating. Maybe there are some that don't, but the vast majority of cultures on earth have a version of the ghost trope and it differs depending on cultural differences. But like, there's a reason we keep coming back to this idea that your body dies, but your spirit is stuck here. And it's because it's both like kind of, kind of, heartwarming but also like really terrifying to think Mm -hmm. about like like i don't know if i get stuck in somebody's house after i die and all i can do is like move their furniture around to see if they (laughs) notice like what's that gonna be like i know i'm so obsessed with this sort of uh like physics of ghosts like presuming that ghosts are real like where do they get anchored why the same in harry potter like why why do you become a ghost how does that happen where can you move um i just i need to know all the answers (laughs) yeah yeah i think that um you mentioned the bad blood chapter that uh Zach wrote, which was on AV Club. And I think that one of the things that makes a really different monster or a really interesting monster is the level of empathy that the writers and directors and performers playing that monster can bring to that character. And I do think that is what X-Files did that set it apart from mm-hmm. even Buffy. Like X-Files was terrific at coming up with monsters that even if you thought they were evil and, you know, deserved to be punished or whatever, they had some core to them where you were like, "Oh, I recognize what's human about this. I I recognize within myself the parts of myself that could twist toward the monstrous if like this was some hunger I had or this was some yeah. need that I had." And like the best monsters are often just like a need or desire that a lot of human beings have that is twisted to a point where we realize how horrible that desire can become if you uh you know if it, if it goes beyond the limits of like sort of what's what's acceptable and um i think x-files really excelled at that but i also think like x-files had a lot of monsters where you just were like yeah i really like sympathize with that person where they were just like very accessible human people. Probably the classic example Mm -hmm. is Clyde Bruckman in the Mm -hmm. season three episode where it's like he's set up to be the monster of the week, but instead he turns out to be um, sort of the, the person who helps Mulder and Scully solve the case. And he's uh, his whole thing is he's a psychic who can only see when people will die and how they not when people will die. He will only see how people will die. So like, Mm -hmm. and it's just, there's a real poignancy to this idea of like, Everybody you see, you get a quick flash of like their dying moment and like how horrible would that be? And that's probably the best episode of the show. Like it's not my favorite, but like if you were going to watch one X-Files episode, that would be the one you should watch. And it's it's just a gorgeous piece of television writing because it's so, so tragic, but like it keeps this this sort of levity of spirit about it that marks it as an X-Files episode. Yeah, the the X Files series in particular is one that I like binge watched and only watched once. Yeah. So very few episodes really like pop out to me like that one, but it is definitely one there that it's just if I could exemplify what X Files is, that's definitely one of the episodes I think of. Uh, the yeah, other I'm, being the modern day Prometheus or the postmodern post-modern Prometheus. Yeah. Yes. That is oh, that. God. <laughs> <laughs> I I wrote an essay about that in the book. Mm-hmm. That, that's one of the ones I reviewed. And it's the longest essay in the book because that is an episode riddled with issues, like riddled with what you would call quote unquote problematic content. Mm-hmm. But it's, there's something so primal and beautiful about it that like, yeah. I can't entirely write it off. Like I don't want to get too deep into it and, and, and spoil the audience, but in essence, <laughs> one of the problems with X-Files is that it did a lot of body horror and it did a lot of body horror directed towards women and that body horror directed towards women tended to take the form of rape slash um, unwanted pregnancies forced upon a woman. And like, yeah. that's definitely a trope that pops up a lot in horror centered on women. I mean, Rosemary's Baby is probably the classic <laughs> example, but yeah. but it's definitely like... the. The X-Files did it so many times that it kind of became almost callous. And postmodern Prometheus has some of those problems, but it's also got mm. this gorgeous depiction of what it what it's like to be an outsider in a small town. And like, 
I weigh those two things against each other um, in the essay. I hope you all buy the book um, and and uh, get to read this essay. But like, uh, there's a version of it, a less edited, less coherent version of it, exists for free on the AV Club. So you could also just read mm-hmm. that. But yeah, I'm really fascinated by the way that like often monsters dovetail the things that are best about us with the things that are worst about us. And that includes like, even in a show like the X-Files where what's good about that show and what's bad about that show are often like just right within the same scene. Uh, I'm just sitting here thinking about how true that is. And how, <laughs> much, how I'm going to write up this episode, buy the book and make sure that I can kind of sit with that idea for a little longer. I, I love about the Clyde Bruckman episode, you know, to your point earlier, Emily, about like the the things about the monsters are things we either relate to or or kind of like worry about ourselves. Yeah. Um, like to me, that episode is is saying like, hey, humans are the only animals cursed with the knowledge of our own death. And that is an extreme example. And it's something where, you know, it plays out um, in knowledge of other people and that makes it a little bit easier to kind of like stand out and remove and analyze it but i'm thinking here like yeah i I don't know what life would be like to live not knowing that i will die one day Um, and it's just it like invites you to kind of do that um and i you know self-consciously i sort of see it in myself as a like a yeah man moment where i'm like yeah man we know we're gonna (laughs) die but that's what i don't know that's what um horror sci-fi fantasy does for me right. um it's like gives me a a sort of like screen upon which to like project uh all of like plato style you know like all of these things swirling within me that are a little bit too bright to look at directly i suppose you could argue that the thing that like helped us build human civilization and uh hastened our demise as a species was like that we became aware that that we could die and like mm. suddenly we're like oh well we gotta like essentially leave like all other species sort of the way that they escape death is they reproduce and like, Mm -hmm. you know, they don't realize why they're doing that. It's just a primal drive. But like we were suddenly like, Oh wait, we can die. We'd better like leave things behind. We'd better create a system that makes it harder to die. And uh, we did that so well that we killed the planet. So good for us. Yeah. And like, capitalist accumulation, colonialism, like all of these, all of these things, mm-hmm. generational wealth, like these are all, um, I think, yeah, like they're, they're band-aids against death. Um, and the illusion that, you know, if something about you uh, exists after you, that isn't like giving back, enriching people's lives, you know, like yeah. some, some more um, kind of like societally minded um, idea that like if you and your immediate descendants um, can be like insulated somehow, I think the the urge is that you can be insulated against death, uh, but that's you know not possible for and, any of us. And yet, if you look at like the top horror tropes, like the ones we talked about, ghost, vampire, but also like the zombie, like they're all mm. warnings against what it is to try to live past death. And mm-hmm. like it's it's like we're trying to warn ourselves about ourselves, but are like doing a really poor job of it because like <laughs> I mean I would love to be a vampire. Like if there are any vampires listening right now, please come over. <laughs> uh, we'll uh, wait. I just invite vampires into my house. You, like, you <laughs> did. You, you broke the cardinal rule there, Emily. <laughs> I just uh, I just really screwed that all up. But anyway, I, I would be a vampire. I think it sounds fun. It sounds very glamorous. Mm. Have you seen Only Lovers Left Alive? Uh, yes, it was back when it came out. So I don't remember it that well. But yeah, I have seen it. Yeah, it was a, a 2014 film. I mentioned it on the show before um, with Tilda Swinton and Tom Hiddleston as the like protagonist vampires. Um, and I haven't rewatched it since then. So there could be aspects of it that I today would not like be super in love with. Um, but I, I loved it so much because it focuses on uh, the sort of like decadence and boredom <laughs> and mm. just like day to day um living of what it means to be alive for centuries uh, or even millennia. Yeah. Um, what we do in the shadows is another one. Yeah. That, and that t- takes it from a more comedic point of view, but both the film and the TV show are very interested in like, God, how much would it suck to be like alive for centuries upon centuries? Like mm-hmm. it would not be fun. You would get bored really easily. I get bored if I, my internet goes out for an hour. Like, <laughs> Yeah. I know. I think about that often. Um, I just read Gia Tolentino's book, Trick Mirror, oh, yeah. uh, a collection of essays about like being alive and on the internet. Um, and the sort of like reckoning with the sort of momentary 
uh, terror of being alone, like without your phone for a moment, uh, <laughs> just really echoes that that like that soundless void of death. Uh, and even though my brain might not make that connection in the moment, I do know that like any moment that my hand like automatically reaches for Twitter uh, when I am like idle waiting for a bus, um, I'm just like, yeah, no, I know I'm going to die one day. Brain, like, thank you for trying to distract me against that. <laughs> Well, we know what happens to people who don't have the expectation of seeing other people. And like, I mean, we're ta- even talking about like the most hermit-like person, the most introverted person. Like you sort of need that dopamine hit of like hearing another human voice, even if it's just outside your window. And like, that is what's, uh, that is like really fascinating to me. This idea that like we are hardwired to want human contact and tech has like taken that desire and amped it up to 13. And like, Mm -hmm. it's like, it's like rotted all of our brains. And you're absolutely right. Like when I misplace my phone for five minutes, I just get like really desperate in a way that I don't, if I like, I don't know, misplace my wife, she'll find her way back. (laughs) She's a person. She knows yeah. what she's she doing. Eventually. Um, I, I think that brings up a really interesting point about like uh, the rise of isolationist horror in uh, in recent years, especially like with the lighthouse and stuff, which I'm still blown away by having seen that uh, like what a month ago, a month and a half ago. I still think about it every day, you know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I really love this boom we have in like, I guess you'd say indie horror. I know a lot of people are not, huge fans of it but um just for me those movies have been so meaningful um Mm. you know there a lot of them are kind of about like transgressions against society i mean horror is always about transgressions against society Mm -hmm. but like these movies tend to be about like really rigid uh communities often like death cults that Mm -hmm. are um that are dictated by like incredibly specific rules and like i had this thought after i saw the movie ready or not uh, a few months ago uh mm. which is a movie a, a very fun pulpy kind of horror movie where uh, a woman marries into a family and then they try to kill her um and that movie like again there's a death cult there's a rich family that's just like writing everything down into the grave and i'm just like I'm wondering why in the 2010s we have all of these movies about like like old rich people who just like want everybody to die and are like dragging everyone say. off the cliff huh. with them. I don't know what that's about. Like what psychic need as a society are we expressing <laughs> through these films? Who can say? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Where on earth did Jordan Peele get those ideas from? <laughs> Honestly, oh, so good. The, the turn of like comedic horror in recent years, like uh-huh. being absolutely horrifying but also hitting because comedy and horror have so many of the same like bare bones to them it's all about the the timing whether or not the the result is something horrifying or something uh you know funny and positive is just you know a matter of the genre itself so it's really really nice to see that kind of growth and stuff and i feel like you know we're seeing it more too in in tv and stuff as well and try to trying to bring us back to the monster of the week in the tv uh genre as a whole i just love horror as a way to to teach us about ourselves even though it's not a thing that i would like identify myself as a fan of um and i I wonder if anyone else has sort of examples of like i don't know things that movies make you that horror movies invite you to think about that might not be right on the tin like i for example love jennifer's body and i've loved it from the moment i saw it uh, before it was ironic (laughs) um and and now people realize that it is really good uh and and for me this idea that like you know it's it's exploring relationships between uh women best friends it is about like you know know, women kind of turning violence on men um, and kind of inverting that, you know, woman as like the the target um, presumed or explicit of any uh, sort of horror situation. Or it follows about kind of like shame, um, about sex, about, you know, the ways in which we kind of pass on uh, hurt to others or use others and intimacy as a way to kind of like distract or to to transmit um, things we might be carrying within ourselves. Uh, so I, I don't know, anyone else have a, an idea um, to talk out there for people who might not have really delved into horror yet, but are convinced after our rollicking conversation. <laughs> I think we've just created so many horror fans, honestly. Um, I, I, I actually do have one. Um, y'all seen the movie Midsommar, um, which came out this summer? I have not yet. I, I have not yet. Okay, all right. uh, that is a movie. I, I know with all the spoilers and stuff. I just haven't gotten to see it. I will try to, I will try to not spoil what happens in the movie, but that is a movie about... Um, 
a woman who's used to hanging out with men who finds a community of female friends, let's say, and like finds a... (laughs) I'm so nervous. (laughs) Finds a uh, shared purpose with them that, uh, and like, and like an emotional uh, support system that feels lacking in her everyday life. And for Mm. some reason, this movie tends to speak to a lot of trans women. And I don't know why that could possibly be, but uh, (laughs) it's, it's uh, like, I, there are certainly, there are certainly trans women who kind of hate the way that, director Ari Aster like plays with gender and like fucks around with like our expectations for genders. But like I, as a trans lady, uh, some of my uh, trans lady friends, like we talk about that movie in the way that we talk about, like, I don't know the first time you read the Bible or something like the, I saw that movie at a press screening. It was just like, God, why is this hitting me so hard? And then um, I listened to the score over and over and over again. I was like, Oh, okay. All right. I get this. This is my life story. And like, Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's 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 one of my favorite movies ever made and like I I'm going to watch it again and again and again for the rest of my life and like but it speaks to something so elemental about that experience of being disconnected from your community and then finding a community in which you feel connected which beyond the trans experience is a thing I think anybody can relate to. Mhm. Totally. Absolutely. Also they're murdering people. Hey, always good. <laughs> Listen, we love a murder. We do love a murder. <laughs> not on this not podcast. in real life, and I don't condone it. But yeah, I just I, I'm I'm so grateful, especially around um, the more recent couple years and true crime being as popular in podcasting as it is in every other genre, um, and having more discourse to you know varying levels of nuance about why um, why crime appeals to women and like learning about crime and and kind of showing ourselves um, that even like in a in a chosen way as opposed to just having it inflicted upon us. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. True crime you say. <laughs> you I wouldn't know, know that's anything where the about real that. money is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I cannot wait to hear more, but first, let's grab a refill. Julia, what better way to start 2020 than by talking about Skillshare, one of our oldest and most loyal sponsors. We love them so much. I love Skillshare. Oh, I just love learning new things. They also got a beautiful facelift with a super adorable branding, so it has never been a better time to check out Skillshare. They are an online learning community where millions of people come together to take the next step in their creative journey. They have thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people like all of the conspirators and like us on topics like illustration, design, photography, video, freelancing, and more. They have a whole craft section now. I'm so excited about it. They do. So this week I checked out a course called Styling Your Space, Bringing Creativity to Interior Design by Emily. Henderson, because for the holidays, we got a bunch of adorable prints um, and banners and pendants for uh, our presents. And I want to put them up. But in a way, Julia, that is uh, that is harmonious and adult. So I really enjoyed that. So this year, if you want to explore new skills, deepen your existing passions, or just get lost in creativity and crafts, do it with Skillshare. What you find might surprise and inspire you. And right now, Skillshare is offering our listeners two free months of Skillshare Premium. That means you get unlimited access to all the classes Skillshare has to offer. So at Skillshare.com slash spirits to get two free months of premium membership. Yeah, again, you can go to Skillshare.com slash Spirits2 and get two free months of premium membership. Thanks, Skillshare. Amanda, the holiday season was a little bit rough on me, and I'll admit that I didn't have everything together during the time. You can't be all together all the time, Jules. I can't. And so when I forget to go buy groceries for the day or forget last minute that I was going to start making a meal that's going to take now three hours to cook or that we're going to go out for New Year shortly and I need to, you know, eat something before going out on a big party night. Yes, you do. That is when I turn to DoorDash. So DoorDash connects you to your favorite restaurants in your city. All you have to do is open up the DoorDash app, you choose what you want to eat, and then the food is delivered to you wherever you are. Uh, Not only only is your favorite pizza place or that Chinese place, Amanda, that can make all of the sauces without garlic for you. Yes, they can. They're already on DoorDash, but there's over 340,000 restaurants in 3,300 cities. So you might just find a new place. That's all 50 states and Canada. And whether it's national restaurants you really love or local faves, you can let dinner come to you with DoorDash. 
Yep. So right now our listeners can get $5 off their first order of $15 or more when you go and download the DoorDash app and you enter the promo code SPIRITS. That's $5 off your first order of $15 or more when you download the DoorDash app from the App Store and enter promo code SPIRITS. Yep. Don't forget that's promo code SPIRITS, $5 off your first order from DoorDash. And Julia, what goes better with a delicious meal at any time of day than an amazing cocktail that you made yourself in your own home? Nothing. Nothing goes better than that. There's nothing. That's the answer. Because, again, one of our favorite and most loyal sponsors, Shaker and Spoon, is back to remind you that you can get pretty much the coolest gift for anyone imaginable or the coolest thing for yourself and your home with a Skillshare subscription cocktail box. Basically what happens, they send you enough ingredients to make three different cocktail recipes developed by world-class mixologists, all based on one bottle of liquor. So you get one bottle of that month's spirit and you have all you need to make 12 drinks at home. We hung out with the folks from Shaker and Spoon at our office warming party and they brought the ingredients to make Applejack cocktails. And oh my God, I can still taste them. It is so delicious. I gave two different Shaker and Spoon boxes as gifts this holiday season and the recipients were over the moon. It's a great way to try new spirits or to try new ways to enjoy your favorites. So you can actually get $20 off your first box at shakerandspoon.com slash creepy. That's a new code because we wanted to change it up for 2020. Shakerandspoon.com slash creepy to get $20 off your first box. Thanks, Shaker and Spoon. I look forward to getting my delivery real soon. Absolutely. And now let's get back to the show. So we talked a little bit earlier about vampires and ghosts in the Monster of the Week genre. And I've been watching a lot of, this is going to make me sound like such a dork, I've been rewatching a lot of Charmed on Netflix lately, yeah. because that was a very like informative TV show that I would like wake up in the on the weekends and watch at 10 a.m. because they always had reruns on. Uh, and like one of the biggest tropes that they play with in particular because it's so deep into the lore of the show is demons. And I would love to talk a little bit about like how gender and demons in Monster of the Week shows is played with a lot because yeah. the the Ge what, like when you gender the demon uh, more like masculine presenting. It usually tends to be about like power and control and more like focused on basically domineering and then killing women. Ouch, not great. Uh, but then the the show uh, plays really hard with any any women uh, who are antagonists on the show are like extremely sexualized and you know you know use that sexuality in order to you know, control men, uh, which, you know, goes against whatever the women protagonists on the show are trying to do. So I'd love to kind of just talk about kind of the cliche of that in terms of the Monster of the Week uh, genre. Yeah, I um, I love demon stories. Mm -hmm. um, I, I grew up fundamentalist Christian, so of course I love demon stories. Of course. Um, uh, the new Charmed is actually pretty good, too, uh, the, the remake of it. Um, which I, I watched the first season. I haven't gotten into any of the rest of it, but it, I'm like, yeah. It's not, like, great television. Neither was the original, to be fair. Yeah, no, the original <laughs> was not either. But it's not, like, great television, but it's certainly entertaining and, like, and, like nicely acted and all of that. Anyway... Um, when I, I'm working on a book, I haven't sold it or anything. I haven't like, like my agent doesn't even know I'm working on this book. So I don't know why I'm telling Publishers everybody, listen up. I don't know why I'm telling everybody on this show, but like I've started like working on a book about, um, writing about my favorite horror movies, uh, mm -hmm. through a lens of like sort of a uh what daniel ortberg would call a trans adjacent memoir um <laughs> writing about the intersection of horror and uh trans feminine identities because it crops up a lot when you talk to trans women that like horror speaks to us in a way that is uh different and unusual and i'm thinking i've been it kind of the project kind of started because i was thinking about when i was uh a hashtag teen my favorite movie was The Exorcist. And The Exorcist is a movie about a teenage girl whose body is invaded by an unwanted male presence who like warps yeah. her into a horrifying version of herself. And like, yeah. I was not out to myself at the time. I had no idea what trans meant, but like that movie spoke to me and I wonder why. Um, and like, <laughs> that is the thing that I love about demons is they are just kind of an all purpose. You can craft a demon that will like 
like latch on to literally anything that's bad in humanity. Like you think about the old uh, Catholic slash Christian cosmology of demons. They tended to have demons who were like attached to specific sins. So like Mm -hmm. you'd have a big fat demon and that would be gluttony and you'd have like, uh, you know, a really hot demon and that would be lust. And like, that was just like the way that they sort of thought about um, the demon issue and like the more i think about it um the movie seven which doesn't have any demons in it is a demon movie like it's a Mm -hmm. movie in which in which these sins are personified like Mm -hmm. like i love demons because they're so all-purpose but also that might be why they struggle a bit compared to like vampires and ghosts and some of these Mm. other creatures that are a little bit more specific also demons certainly aren't directly tied to certain religions but in our culture they feel tied to uh christianity in a way that like they aren't necessarily but but you know in in a world where like christianity has lost some of its grasp over american society though you wouldn't know to see it um (laughs) That that you know feels a little less uh, relevant. I do, so I do I like I love I love demons, but I also think their non specificity is sort of what keeps them from the top of the heap. Yeah, and I think that they lose a little bit of nuance too. Like I think when it comes to people writing demons over, let's say ghosts or vampires, because they are very much like just the, the just the distilled uh, feeling of the the emotion that they're supposed to represent it they feels like they most people don't dig deeper than that yeah. and i think that it they lose a little bit of the familiarity that vampires werewolves ghosts have to our culture by you know existing only as like stock characters almost yeah exactly like a demon can be anything and that's both really a powerful storytelling tool but also like it gets a little numbing because it can be anything, mm-hmm. but it's also always has the same goal, which is to find some way to make you do something evil. And like, mm-hmm. sure. Um, there's a, there's a show on TV right now that I think is doing interesting things with this idea, which is CBS is evil, um, oh, which is from I just started it. Yeah. Which is from the Kings who made um, the good wife. And it is for X-Files fans out there. I describe it as a version of X-Files that is only Darren Morgan episodes. And um, it Deep is cut. it is a little bit much. Like it's a little hard to take sometimes, but it's definitely. I think what makes the demon trope work there in a way it hasn't in other Monster of the Week shows is they're specifically asking the question of what causes us to do evil. And one of the answers they're considering is maybe it's just demons. And like, <laughs> I kind of love that the, the brazenness of that it is a, of a TV so show. Optimistic. Yeah, of a TV show in 2019 that's like, could we maybe fix the world with just like mass exorcism? Um, and the, its answer is no. Like, it, it's always like on the side of demons probably don't exist, but you never know. Oh, man, if we could solve the world with just a masked exorcism, that'd be great, (laughs) honestly. Yeah. I'm down for it. I think this is why um, Dr. Faustus, the play, has always Mm -hmm. really, really fascinated me. Uh Um, I, I think it is so, like antithetical to almost all demon representations that we have in in like contemporary media um where for those unfamiliar with the plot like a a scholar named faustus wants to like learn more than he is allowed to be taught and like be the you know basically like smartest person in the world i'm overstating a little bit um but he is he is visited by a demon called mephistopheles um and Faustus like conjures him uh, while writing magic and wants to barter his soul for all these abilities. In the version that I saw um, at the the Globe in London, it was played by Arthur Darville, who like plays a very good kind of like meek um, and like subservient uh, like servant of the devil. And Mephistopheles like doesn't want to be here. <laughs> like <and> some <laughs> critics kind of identify him as the representation of like the sorrow of being separated from God. Uh, but he is there being like Faustus, don't do this. Like it's not it's not good like the devil doesn't want me to tell you this but like you shouldn't do it it's a bad idea and and the you know the thing is like human beings we can see the consequences coming 
status. And yet, um, you know, you you choose to do it. So having a demon, like per your kind of point earlier about um, demons being like representations of the thing that they are tempting you to do. Uh, Mephistopheles is like the opposite of that. He's like, yeah. no, dog, like you don't want to do this. Uh, and so it's so compelling to kind of see and like very poetic and beautiful, uh, you know, to like see the the reasons um, that 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 whole trajectory still goes really south. Yeah, I was thinking about different representations of ghosts now because ghosts are my favorite of of the uh, famous monsters. And um, yeah, like Christmas Carol is such an interesting representation of because they're not really ghosts. They're kind of demons, but also like Mm -hmm. they're doing good. So you can't call them demons, but like Mm. they do sort of personify different aspects of a thing, which is what I often associate demons with being closely tied to a certain location or place or thing or person. And like, that is definitely the case with the the ghosts from Christmas Carol, and I'm I, I'm I just had this thought when you happened to say those words visited by, and I'm like <laughs> I'm, now I'm like sort of thinking about what it means that there's that sort of Venn diagram intersection. Like, I mean, yeah. demons are part of morality tales generally, where you like learn mm-hmm. about like how you're supposed to behave and how you're not supposed to behave. So maybe there's something to that. I, I think if I can extrapolate off that a little bit more, uh, now that you framed that in my mind, all I can think of is the story of Job. Oh. And are are the spirits in, in Christmas girl. Carol in. just acting as the role of the adversary in the uh, the story of Job? Yeah, I think that's, Ooh. yeah, like the, the idea that like, they're, they're good spirits, but mm-hmm. they're framed as ghosts, which we tend to think of as at least, you know, scary, if mm-hmm. not malicious. Sometimes they are malicious, and most of the, but most of the time they're spooky and we don't like them. Mm-hmm. Um, and yet, like, Scrooge makes friends with these ghosts. Scrooge and these yeah. ghosts are tight. <laughs> and, like, <laughs> uh, I, I just, I love that idea of, like, I mean, I realize that, that the, re- the creative reason for them to be ghosts is because, like, Christmas ghost stories used to be very popular, and Dickens was mm-hmm. like, I'll write a Christmas ghost story. But, yeah, the, there's sort of this resonance with other types of horror within A Christmas Carol. And my favorite adaptations of that story always are more horror specific. Yeah, I just I'm obsessed with this idea of a demon wearing a ghost's skin. Yeah. Because <laughs> if demons are the most kind of like shifting and adaptable um, of of the, you know, the big five, we have to come up with some kind of like copyrighted phrase to describe the these like major monsters. Um, just the, the idea that they would put on a trope that you expect or have some preconceived notions about is like dastardly and very demonic. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it is like, like you look behind a lot of these monsters and you find something like a demon lurking there, but Mm -hmm. the monsters that have really taken off are the ones who like gain that like specificity that demons lack. So like there's this kind of, especially in our Western culture where Christianity was so dominant for so long, like there's a kind of give and take between all of these different archetypes that like there's weird, like Venn diagram intersections, you know, where, Hmm. where we find that they kind of overlap. And now I just want to see a ghost vampire. Oh yeah. And I think a ghost with an agenda is also really fascinating. Like, I guess that is the the definition of a, of a haunting. Mm -hmm. If we're going to, I'll submit it to Webster's. Um, But so many ghosts so often, especially in um, kind of like popular understandings and in like the stories we get from, from our listeners for the hometown urban legends specials uh, where the ghost is just is, is like, you can't scry or divine their purpose. Like they cause chaos. And so like from my empathetic brain, I want to say like, what suffering are you undergoing that you're doing this? But sometimes, you know, I don't know, like there, it feels like the, the monster that has the least, um, I don't know, uh, broadly understandable motive. Yeah. Because it's always like, that's the nice thing about a ghost is like, they have kind of the same problem as demons, but in a different way, which is like, they're very specific in terms of like, we know what they are. We know what they do. We know like where they come from, but also then like you reach out to their motivations and it's literally just always like, the question is, you know, you're going to die and you're going to leave something undone. Like, Mm. what are you, what are you not doing now that might cause you to come back as a ghost? And like that answer is so specific to every single individual outside of, you know, figures like the Christmas Carol ghosts, which are again, demons in ghosts clothing. Mm. So cool. I'm going to be thinking about this all day, maybe all year. (laughs) 
until we get to talk about the Christmas Carol again, December exactly. 2020. Yes, December 2020. Mark it down. We're already, we're already scheduling you for it, Emily. Oh, <laughs> hopefully the world is still here. Hopefully. Fingers <laughs> Listen, crossed. If we're all there together, we will talk about ghosts and make merry. <laughs> um, I just I just actually, I literally just like signed a deal for a project that will come out in 2024. And I'm like, will the oh world still be around in 2024? Probably not. So I Hopefully they never, pay you in advance. I will never <laughs> yeah. have to do this. So I yeah. <laughs> your contract as if the world won't be here in five years yeah. and if you if, if it comes to it you'll figure it out yeah. <laughs> emily vanderwerf thank you so much for joining us uh to talk about everything that i love and stuff that i uh, could continue talking about for the, the rest of time hey it was so <laughs> great to be here um do you need me to plug stuff yes you're, you're welcome just about. to okay um <laughs> Since it's January 1st, uh, you can go and check out the feed for my podcast, Arden. It is a true crime. I, I always call it a true crime parody. I don't know that that's specifically true, but it is a true crime show where uh, it's fictional cases that we solve every season, but they're simultaneously based on real true crime cases and Shakespeare plays. Mm. Um, and our season two is about to launch and uh, we probably have some goodies up on the feed for you to listen to. So check out Arden on the podcatcher of your choice. Prime time uh, is also available on pod catchers. It is a, the first season is about the intersection of the presidency and television. Uh, we should know soon if we get to make a second season, uh, I also have this long uh, running interview show called uh, I Think You're Interesting that is available on podcatchers everywhere and uh, that it was just me talking to people I thought were interesting. Um, you, can buy, <laughs> you can buy Monsters of the Week in bookstores. You can find my writing on Vox.com and you can find my Twitter at TVOTI. That's Twitter.com slash Tivoti. <laughs> strongly endorse uh, following both you and your wife on Twitter. Oh, yeah. Y'all are, uh, are truly goals. She's it's a delight. Great. She's a delight, isn't she? Yeah, absolutely. And I love that she doesn't read your Twitter at all. It's just like, <laughs> it's it's so heartwarming. As a, as a, as a fellow uh, internet creator, uh, half of an internet creator couple, I just, I appreciate the, the, the strong divide. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Um, Emily, thank you. And listeners, if you are visited by a demon wearing the skin of a ghost, stay calm and just remember, stay creepy. Stay cool. Thanks again to our sponsors. At Skillshare.com slash Spirits2, you can get two free months of Skillshare Premium. In the DoorDash app, enter promo code SPIRITS at checkout for $5 off your first order of $15 or more. And at ShakerAndSpoon.com slash Creepy, you can get $20 off your first box. Spirits was created by Amanda McLaughlin, Julia Shafini, and Eric Schneider, with music by Kevin McLeod and visual design by Allison Wakeman. Keep up with all things creepy and cool by following us at Spirits Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Tumblr. We also have all of our episode transcripts, guest appearances, and merch on our website, as well as a form to send us your urban legends at spiritspodcast.com. Join our member community on Patreon, patreon.com slash spiritspodcast for all kinds of behind the scenes stuff. Just one dollar gets you access to audio extras with so much more available too. Recipe cards, director's commentaries, exclusive merch, and real physical gifts. We are a founding member of Multitude, a collective of independent audio professionals. If you like spirits, you will love the other shows that live on our website at multitude.productions. And above all else, if you liked what you heard today, please share us with your friends. That is the very best way to help us keep on growing. Thank you so much for listening. Till next time.